Hi, good afternoon, everybody. It's so nice to be in front of you all again. Um, this is my third time being with you. It's only our second time being in here because uh, the pandemic got us last time, uh, but it's good for uh, to be with folks again. I remember the first time that I was here was four years ago, which seems like it was so long ago, but I was a first time candidate from the Mon Valley who had almost no name recognition and was really building up from scratch. Uh, but we were building a movement then and I ran uh, at that time because I truly believe that we had an opportunity to organize and to build with folks who had never had folks come into their doors, had never been engaged in the political processes uh, the way that folks in this community have been. And since then, we've been building with folks around economic justice, around environmental racism, including helping to shut down a fracking well that was going to be the closest to a densely populated the community that we would have gotten. Uh, I know a lot of you all were with us as we were fighting uh, against that proposal, as we were organizing frontline community members, as we saw folks come in from other communities that had already been impacted by fracking. And it was an honor to be able to use our campaign resources in that uh, endeavor. Uh, we've been fighting for a fair wage, a living wage for all. I have been on every union picket line, every protest uh, for our workers. And we have been fighting for that. And I'm proud to have a bill that would uh, create one fair wage. Uh, we have been fighting since then for housing justice and transportation justice. We have been reaching and building a coalition in, in ways that we have never seen in this region, black folks and white folks and brown folks, folks from suburban communities and rural communities and urban communities. We have been building with folks of different socioeconomic statuses. And because of that, we've been able to tackle issues like policing. Uh, I'm proud to have led our Commonwealth uh, on our police accountability slate of legislation uh, that because I was willing to fight differently uh, and help to get my colleagues to fight a little differently with me, that we were able to take the rostrum right after George Floyd's killing. And because we took that rostrum, we were able to get our Republicans to move for the first time in decades and decades on police bills, uh, winning a police database bill that's one of its kind and probably one of the few uh, democratic bills that passed bipartisan unanimously that was not a name bridge or uh, a bridge namer, which we do a lot of. I've, <laughs> yeah, it's been a hard four years. It's been a hard four years. When you come to a space and you're fighting for folks who are rarely uh, in these spaces, fighting for folks who are the most marginalized, that means you have to tackle the hardest issues first. Not just starting from the ground, but we also have to think about folks who are living uh, differently than us. So we are talking about folks who don't have health care, folks who don't have clean water and clean air. Those are the folks that we have been prioritizing in this movement, and I've been proud uh, to work with you. I'm running for Congress right now because we have an opportunity. For the first time in 26 years, we have an open seat. We are going to need people who are going to excite our base, who are going to energize it. We have double turnout in my race. We had over 50% turnout in a pandemic. We are going to need that if we're going to win our governor race and our Senate races. You told me I was going to get more time because I was running for two. I'm joking. It's fine. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> yes, ma'am. We have a question that came in on the chat. Um, you were the first black women elected to the, from Western Pennsylvania to the state house. And if you win the congressional seat, I think you would be the first black women in all of Pennsylvania to hold that seat. What does that mean to you and to the people you fight for? Certainly. Uh, yes, that is true. And it's, it's something that I'm incredibly proud of, though I think that we as a community should be proud of that. Um, we have a long history. This is one of the original 13 colonies and to still be breaking those concrete ceilings is, is something that we have to, to work on that we have to be intentional on. For me and what it means is, is that when I knock on doors sometimes, I talk to people who have never seen somebody who looks like them and sounds like them, uh, who have navigated society like them, speaking at their door about issues that they care about, about issues that they need. It's the opportunity to recenter the folks whose political needs we are uh, putting on the forefront. Uh, 
because those are the community members who will be our base, who will turn out. But infrequently, do they have somebody or have a reason to turn out? Uh, that's how we were able to double voter turnout, by reaching people who even the Democratic Party has said, it's not worth talking to those folks. They're not super voters. Or why go into that community? Those aren't, those aren't the type of voters that you should focus on. We focused on them and we brought them out. And now we are writing legislation with them. Those are the people who are in our office advising us on policies that they understand their tenants there are, there are folks who are public transit users, um, and that's incredible. But also, I think it's incredible because it's important to recognize the revolving door that we see too often. And what we know is, is that when we think about who is uh, allocating resources, when we think about who gets those resources and avail themselves of the access, it's often not people who come from my community. When we think about who gets the grant money or who has walking around money and who they give it to, they don't often give it to the poor black business owner who we need to get resources and funds. They're not often giving it to folks who look like me. We have to break that up. And the way that we do that is by ensuring that we have representation, not just of our race, but class representation, people who have uh, come from different communities and different economic backgrounds. Uh, that's how I've been tackling uh, my time in Harrisburg and hopefully in, in Washington, D.C., and it's not easy. I need support, right? I come without those same networks that a lot of my opponents or a lot of my colleagues come with because I didn't grow up around politics. I didn't grow up uh, with those uh, wealthy networks, but we're building it, and we're building it every single day, and I think it's worthwhile. <laughs> My goodness, uh, that is the question that I think we would all like to answer. You know, tensions in the Middle East are such a complicated web, and they've been a complicated web for so long. And like a lot of those tensions, the United States does play a role in it, you know, and we have and not just the United States, you know, other superpowers have played roles in it. These are areas that we're fighting over natural resources, for instance. Um, particularly right now as we're looking at the Ukrainian crisis, we're looking at the perfect example for why we have to uh, have energy independence and why we should not over rely on fossil fuels. Fossil fuels and extraction has uh, funded and it's fuel wars uh, for time memorial, right? And these are communities that are also vulnerable because they are destabilized. They've been destabilized. These are communities that are post-colonialism, uh, where they are looking for some sort of autonomy. Um, and the United States is having to really uh, work out what is our interaction going to be with communities like that, as we recognize that military intervention is not the way always, right? But also recognizing that because of the role we've played through past military intervention, right, past um, uh, funding and appropriations, right, that we have some sort of role. And I think that um, that is a, the position that we're in as a country right now. But oil, racism, a lot of that is fueled by the othering of people, right? When we think about our reaction to folks in the Middle East, we're talking about people who are not white. Uh, some of them are, right? But we are talking about a lot of folks who are black and brown and who we don't often see ourselves in. And so we are not always willing uh, to see the humanity in them when we take actions or when we think about what our diplomacy, our diplomatic uh, position will be on that. So I think that we're having that globally, right? That, that reckoning about how black and brown people, right, are, are, are people. Right, or they are humans and they are not just collateral damage. I think it's an oil question. I think it is also uh, a military aid question. So uh, we have a lot more to talk about on that one. That's a great question. Oh, the same thing that will happen if Malcolm Kenyatta wins both and if Austin Davis wins both, uh, two candidates before me who are also running for both seats. Oh, no, it's okay. We are all running for both. Uh, and we're all running for both because each of us have come into a space where none of us have occupied, where people like have never occupied. Me and Austin are the first Black people outside of the city of Pittsburgh to ever serve. And we both served at the time. Austin will still be serving in a majority white district. Uh, my district used to be about 70-something percent Black or white, and it's actually been created as a new minority opportunity district. I believe, and Malcolm, of course, who is our uh, gay black man in our district. We've been representing people who we care about and communities that we care and we fight for. And I can speak for me specifically that it's important to me. My service has been, it's been the honor of my life. 
and it's been challenging, but we have been able to tackle issues and bring a new perspective to office that I don't believe we've had from Western Pennsylvania. And I've been able to, through that perspective, push and challenge and expand the realm of what's possible for even my Democratic colleagues. Republican colleagues are something different. Um, I don't think I have the magic to, to fix that one. But with our Democratic colleagues, I see them move differently because of uh, our relationships, the relationships that we've built. Um, I would be loath to, to just give that up willy-nilly. So I am running for both. I think that the perspective that I bring, I would, I would be honored to go to DC and represent a group of folks who have never been represented in this Commonwealth uh, in Washington, DC. And on the chance that I am not, I would be honored if folks would uh, still want me to represent in my state house seat. Oh, if we win both, it goes to a special election. Oh, I get to decide. <laughs> it goes to a special election for the House seat. So what happens is if I were to win both seats uh, in November, we would have a, a round of special elections. What happens is, is that you have to give up one. Uh, when you give up one, uh, candidates will come forth, which I think, and that's the other reason why I ran for both, to be completely honest, is because we're in a redistricting year. I know a lot of people who are qualified, who are active and engaged in our communities, who are very interested in being state representatives. And they did not run because they didn't know what district they would be in, or they weren't able to get, uh, gather infrastructure in a time. And some of them, because they respected me and they wanted to wait. Uh, but I think that it's going to be a robust race. And I think that there are going to be a lot of qualified candidates who you would love to meet. Uh, and you all will have an opportunity to do that. But we have to first get through this race. Oh, my time. Thank you all so much. We told Summer she could have a couple extra minutes since she's running for two races. So there's... <laughs> There's one more question. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you so much. Oh, my goodness. That's my favorite question ever. If I were in charge of democratic strategy, I would tell Democrats to invest heavily uh, in its true base, right? There are black and brown voters. There are young voters. There are progressives and liberals. Um, I think that that is important that we are putting money into there and recognizing that those voters are also deserving of our courtship, that we have to go to them also. I think too often the Democratic Party relies on a really incestuous kind of revolving door uh, politics, right, where we, in we invest in the same consultants and those consultants give us the same stale and kind of outdated methods, which is usually mail, 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 TV, TV, TV. Uh, we're not investing enough on those sorts of platforms that reach and follow the voters who we need. So I think that that's number one. Number two, gerrymandering. Gerrymandering isn't just a Democrat versus Republican thing. And we were dealing with that here in Pittsburgh. We are having a reckoning right now where we're saying as a party that are we going to be a reflective party that looks like our voters, that looks like our country, or are we going to continue to say that we will sacrifice black and brown voters every 10 years to make it easier for another district to have a blue seat? And that's a balance that we're going to have to weigh, right? Um, Investing in the candidacies of exciting people is the third thing that I would say. There are people who come from communities who are black women and, and brown folks and black men and, and, and gay folks and, and trans folks who are qualified. They are qualified and they are, do have experiences. Their experiences may be different uh, than what we are accustomed to, but if the party were investing into those types of races, we would see a, we would see a groundswell from those communities where they bring people in. Uh, door knocking and grassroots is important and we can't ignore ignore those. So that's what I would do. And also I would say, pass the bills that we say we are fighting for. If we have a trifecta in the House and the Senate and the uh, presidency, then we shouldn't be talking about if we're going to raise, when we're going to raise the wage, right? We shouldn't be talking about health care. We shouldn't be talking about housing justice. We shouldn't be talking about environmental policy when we say that we're the party of science. Now we got to put our money where our mouth is. And we have to start to get those things across the finish line because our voters turned out, they knocked doors for us. They donated to us. They ordered organized. And we have to honor that commitment that they have made to us by delivering those things that they felt most important. Now my time is up. <laughs> that was a good question.